Welcome back into the Door Report, episode 237 on a Monday evening, September 11th. Never forget, September 11th, Monday evening here. As always here at the Door Report, we are presented by Corey Perkins of Parks Realty. If you're a first-time home buyer or looking to move homes in the Nashville area, reach out to Corey via phone, via phone call or text at the updated number. I've been reading the incorrect phone number up until now, so get down a pen and paper and write down this correct number for Corey Perkins. That number is 615-967-8623, or you can reach out to Corey via email at Perkins at Realtracks.com, Realtracks spelled R-E-A-L-T-R-A-C-S.com. For myself, Will Byram, I am joined, as always, by my co-host Trevor Hewlin, 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 Trevor, right before we started recording, informed me that I have been mispronouncing his name the entire time he has been on this podcast, and he has not corrected me. I so just, tell the people how to properly say your last name, Trevor. It's just, it's it's been all my life people have mispronounced my name, so I've just got to the point where I'm like, yeah, whatever. Uh, my last name is pronounced Hewlin. Hewlin. Hugh, like the color, and Lynn, like a girl's middle name. Hugh Lynn. Hugh Lynn. Trevor Hugh Lynn. I've been doing a big disservice to Trevor, so my deepest apologies. But it is partially Trevor's fault for I just didn't not correct once, you. Not once telling me I was saying it I wrong. just I've told nobody. That's as a man nobody. as a man with the last name Byram. B y r u m. Everybody loves to pronounce my name Byram. My entire life. There's no way. D- Ask, are you serious? Ask my entire family. It is about 50 50 that people pronounce it Birum. I don't know why it doesn't make any sense. And we're like, no, it's buy rum. Like you're buying rum. I could have a hell Just of a sound it out. I could have a fantastic name for a liquor store. It's already built in. But Trevor, on episode 237, we have a disappointing recap. The doors get pretty dominated, pretty much dominated by Wake Forest 36 to 20. A lot to get into from that game. A lot of reaction. We have our three key takeaways from the game, as always. We're going to run through a quick stat recap and some key plays of the game. But this is probably one of the least prepped for episodes that I've ever done. Because, Trevor, I was working from home today and heard a noise inside of my closet in my bedroom. And I walked in, and my entire closet floor was covered in water. And there was water coming through my ceiling. So I've been a little bit frazzled and everywhere today, but thankfully, shout out to the maintenance here, maintenance guys inside of our apartment. They came in and uh, got it fixed pretty quickly, but it's been not a great day for your boy. Not a great stretch in general, but how are the vibes before we get into the detailed breakdown of this uh, this loss? Well, I'll just say this. For you in particular, a bad Vanderbilt loss, a bad Titans loss, awesome. and then on Monday, you have a leak in your closet and you're still doing the pod. This screams grit to me. As as also this is as gritty as it gets. As an unimportant side note, I'm in three fantasy football leagues. All three of my teams lost. How did you do this weekend gambling? Uh, Saturday was okay outside of my Vanderbilt gambling picks. I was up like 12 units during college football, and I was down about about eight units on the NFL. So not a good NFL Sunday gambling, but a pretty solid college football day gambling. And if Vanderbilt had not been absolutely horrendous and came out and performed very poorly again uh i would have had a hell of a weekend gambling wise yeah but a a weekend overall for you not been great but you're still doing the pod on a monday it on a once again tdr doing a pod on a holiday yeah well all this it damn i shouldn't have said that it's actually not a holiday it's a day of remembrance a solemn day can we cut that yeah no Okay. You know, it's just you didn't say anything bad. You just said it's probably will be a hall. I don't know. We're kind of past that point. All right. It's late. I've but already had before, classes. He's already Trevor's already had his classes canceled. Also, my company is currently being acquired. Uh, I'm working for a new company starting tomorrow. So that's also been going on on top of the horrific week into football and my ceiling nearly caving in in my closet and some other personal things going on. It's been a tough stretch, as we've mentioned. But here at the Doorport, we're gritty. Does not stop us from producing great content for Commodore Nation out there. Before we get into the full Wake Forest recap and much more, don't forget to follow us on Twitter and Instagram at The Door Report. Like us on Facebook. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Our podcast is available on iTunes, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. And while you're at it, give our podcast five stars and a review on iTunes. It's now time for breaking news. (laughs) 
All right, Trevor. This is not a hyped up, amped up hype episode of the Door Report. It's time to get back to reality. It's time to face the music. It's time to recap Vanderbilt's loss Saturday against Wake Forest. The doors fell 36 to 20. A lot of shooting themselves in the foot. The first thing that we're going to get into is the box score, because mm-hmm. I think that that tells a little bit of the story of the game. Uh, before I do that, we do have some new five-star reviews on Apple. I think we're going to save those for the UNLV preview. Uh, that's when we'll read off the most recent round of five-star reviews. But getting into the box score of the Vanderbilt-Wake Forest game, we'll start off with A.J. Swan, 26 of 39 for 314 yards, three touchdowns, and two picks. On the Wake Forest side, Mitch Griffiths, 17 of 26, 196 yards, two touchdowns, no picks. Trevor, how did you feel about the performance you saw from AJ on Saturday? Um, Sloppy, but, I mean, calling the bench him, I think, is literally so dumb. Um, he's your quarterback of the future. Um, he, he was sloppy. I mean, there's no other way to put it. He was sloppy. He had some good throws, but overall, he was very sloppy. The the whole team was sloppy. I, I think we have some stats that are going to illustrate that better. Uh, illustrate what we all saw watching the game. The team was sloppy. The game was sloppy. The stats may not play that out in some areas, but there were there was a lot left on the field for Vanderbilt. Getting into the rushing game, Patrick Smith, 10 carries for 77 yards. Seti Alexander, 10 carries for 28 yards. Logan Kyle, one carry for 12 yards. On the Wake Forest side, this is the most shocking uh, part of the box of the uh, box score here. Wake Forest ran 48 times as a team for 288 yards, six yards a carry. Without their leading running Without back. Without their starting running back, Justice Ellison. Desmond Claiborne, uh, 26 carries for 165 yards. Tate Carney, 13 carries for 117 yards. Unacceptable. I don't think either of us expected the defense to struggle that much against the ground game. It was shocking to see in the final box score that Mitch Griffiths only threw for 196 yards. Yeah. If, if you would have told me that Wake Forest threw for 196 yards before this game started, I would have said Vanderbilt walked out of there, walked out of Winston-Salem with a victory. That was not the case because Vanderbilt got absolutely dominated on the ground. There's, yeah. there's no other way to put it. Yeah, it was – man – it was disheartening to see, and it's and, and we'll get into it a little bit. We'll get into it a little bit more, but just for a, a defensive front, um, the defensive line that, and I'll take the L on this. I'll I'll say that I was wrong. I hyped up this defensive line going into the season. I thought they were going to be much improved. I thought it was something to be very excited about. Um, we both did. They, I, I was wrong. They were they they were awful in this game. And they've been awful so far, and there's they haven't shown anything. They haven't shown anything good. Yeah. The team, this team, the only consistent thing about this Vanderbilt team has been inconsistency. I've used that quote a lot about the basketball program, used that quote a lot about the football program. It applies again on team three, year three for Clark Lee's roster here. From the receiving core, London Humphreys was outstanding. One of the one of the few guys on the roster you can say was outstanding. Four catches, 190 yard, 109 yards, and one touchdown was named SEC Freshman of the Week. Well deserved. Will Shepard once again, eight catches, 87 yards, two touchdowns, six touchdowns already on the year. He is a mismatch across the field. He's going to shatter Jordan Matthews' touchdown. I didn't. I didn't think that's something we would say. I thought he might break it. He's not going to break it. He is going to shatter it. Well, at this at this pace. I, I'm just extrapolating out the stats here. At this pace, he's going to catch 24 touchdown passes. Yeah, he's <laughs> he he's which is the all-time career touchdown record at Vanderbilt for a career. He's better than we it's thought. 20, he would it's be. 24 touchdown receptions. That's the all-time receptions leader for touchdowns in Vanderbilt history. Is 24. We thought he was going to be amazing. I he's somehow better than we thought he was, which is crazy. Will, he's otherworldly. Will Shepard and Jaden McGowan have not disappointed. Jaden McGowan, once again, six catches for 72 yards. Uh, Junior Sherrill, two catches for 19 yards. Justin Ball, four catches for 17 yards. Quincy, uninvolved once again. Quincy Skinner Jr., one catch for six yards. Logan Kyle, one catch for four yards. Receiving group did what we expected the stats look good but overall the execution in the passing game left something to be desired mm-hmm. absolutely yeah and i think a lot of that too is uh 
and we'll hit on this later, man, whenever we get into our recap, the the offensive scheme right now just doesn't freaking make sense, and it's pissing me off. Yeah, I haven't written down as many notes as I normally do going through the key plays of the game, so it might be a little more chaotic of an in-game key plays of the game recap, so bear with us. We're going to do our best. Uh, on the defensive side of the ball, I want to get into this just a little bit. CJ Wright or CJ Taylor and Dericky Wright both had 10 total tackles. CJ with eight solo tackles, Dericky with seven. CJ Taylor also had two sacks. Uh, pretty much provided, not pretty much did provide the only pressure on the quarterback on Mitch Griffiths the entire game. He was the only disruptor, and it really wasn't the best game from CJ Taylor. Had a lot of missed tackles, also made an incredible stop on the goal line, forcing a fumble uh, from the Wake Forest running back there that gave Vanderbilt fans a little bit of hope in that second half that was ultimately smashed very quickly. Savion Riley, nine total tackles. Kane Patterson and Langston Patterson, the dynamic brother duo, seven total tackles each, but only two solo tackles each. Jalen Mahoney and B.J. Anderson, six total tackles each, and Ethan Barr with three total tackles. Nobody else above three total tackles, so I won't get into the full entire box score, but turnovers. Turnovers, turnovers, turnovers. Lost the game. It, it lost Vanderbilt the game. When you read off the box score, when you look at the team stats, this was not a 16-point game. It just wasn't. It it shouldn't have been in Vanderbilt multiple times missed opportunities, whether it's being stopped at the goal goal line after a great Patrick Smith run where we were both screaming, unhitch the trailer, Pat, come on. You got to get in the end zone there. And then Vanderbilt deciding to line up in shotgun and not run a quarterback sneak at the goal line. We're now getting in to the game recap. So first quarter, it felt like Groundhog Day. I'm like Vanderbilt came out. Vanderbilt came out immediately. The first three plays of the game, run up the middle to Patrick Smith, quick pass to Justin Ball where the turf monster got him, and then throw up a fade to your backup tight end and Logan Kyle. Horrendous decision by AJ Swan to throw that ball you simply cannot throw it but that was the first read on a third and five play was to throw the ball up to your backup tight end I don't understand that whatsoever but also AJ just can't throw it I throw that ball I think there's a lot that you can nitpick about those first three plays of the game because right after that there was a long weather delay in Winston-Salem that we all got to sit we had an emergency delay spaces but it felt like how in the world has Vanderbilt thrown a game altering interception at the beginning of the game both years in a row last year was Mike Wright against Wake Forest return for a touchdown this year was AJ Swan making an inexplicable decision to toss that ball up into double coverage also it's third and five why is that the primary read I understand you may have seen something in film but that is not the time to pull that out there's quick opportunities and timely decisions to be made that that made no sense to me Trevor no, and that just, like you said, that set the tone for the, unfortunately, for the rest of the game, even though they came out of the delay and had a wonderful defensive stop, yeah. uh, which we could not watch. Yeah. Which we just, we weren't, we could not watch because ESPN and the ACC network. Embarrassing. It, Embarrassing for ESPN and the ACC network. It really, it was, uh, there's nothing, I mean, there's nothing else I can say. It was. If it was a disaster. Vanderbilt Vanderbilt was scheduled to kick off at 10 a.m. They were scheduled to have that time slot from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. I do not understand why Vanderbilt was and Wake Forest was taken off the primary network that they were scheduled to play on during the scheduled time slot that they were scheduled to air on the ACC network. And then they just never switched back over to it. No. We just missed eight minutes of action yep. in the game for no reason. But Vanderbilt did make a good goal line stand. They, uh, Wake Forest had the ball at the Vanderbilt 10 uh, right after a turnover that changed the momentum, held Wake Forest to three points. But it did feel like Vanderbilt was on their heels the remainder of the game. Yep. it It's unexplainable, but that is how it felt. And I think fans and players would probably agree with that. Not a ton. Punts back and forth. Wake Forest goes down and scores 10 nothing. Wake Forest. Vanderbilt then has a great drive. Uh, six plays, 75 yards, 2 minutes, 40, 46 or 48 seconds. I can't read here. Uh, Vanderbilt pulls within 3, 10-7 in the second quarter. At that point, after an incredible by- catch by Will Shepard in the back of the end zone. Yeah. Also, just want to hit on that. Incredible catch. Great throw. 
way to get the elbow and ass down. Well, I really felt like it was like, okay, mm-hmm. we've gotten the nerves out. We've gotten the first nerves on a road game. Weird start to a 10 a.m. kick, having the delay. Vanderbilt's going to settle down, and immediately Wake Forest goes down 14 plays, 75 yards, 6 minutes, 41 seconds, and scores another touchdown, 17-7. to yeah, The defense had no stop. They, I feel like, too, if, if they wanted to throw, they did and they had success whenever they wanted to run the ball. They did, and they had success. This Vanderbilt defense had absolutely no no answer for the Wake Forest offense, uh, an offense that you saw last year, um, an offense that Clark Lee knows, having coached under Dave Clawson at Bowling Green as well as Wake Forest. Um, a, a defense that I get it's quirky. I get it's weird. I get slow mesh, space and pace, funky. I get it. I understand. Un, no excuse. Absolutely no excuse to have this sort of defensive performance from Vanderbilt. They just couldn't stop them. There, there was an interesting quote from Clark Lee. I'm actually pulling this from a former TDR member Billy Derrick's Twitter uh, when Clark Lee was on 1025 the game earlier today. Clark said, in quote, we designed to let them run the ball. Giving up 288 yards is not in that design. If that number was 150 to 175, that would have been a game where we would have played the way we wanted to play. I think you felt that. Mm-hmm. Uh, it felt like Vanderbilt was okay giving up something in the rushing game to not allow that slow mesh to hit the big plays downfield. Safeties were staying relatively high throughout the game. And I think Clark probably had a similar opinion on this defensive line in front seven that we did, that they are good enough to prevent this Wake Forest team that struggled to run the ball against Elon from gashing them. And they just were not all game. But this defense was not helped out by the mistakes made by the offense and special teams. Yeah, they were put in bad positions. It was 17 to 14. AJ had thrown another touchdown pass to Will Shepard. Absolutely unguardable mismatch. 17 14, Wake Forest leads by three. The defense gets the stop with 50 seconds left in the half. You're feeling okay. You know, Wake Forest does get the ball to start the half, but you're within three. Your worst case scenario going to be down three points at halftime, and that feels like a win and an inexcusable error. In, in the punt return game, you cannot have that ball bounce off your hands. From that point on the game, I don't want to say it, but the game was over. The moment the momentum shifted, you felt the momentum shifting to Vanderbilt's side after the stop the defense was actually to come up with, able to come up with at the end of the second half. You just you're not good enough. The roster talent is not there. The scheme and coaching staff is not there to make these mistakes repeatedly throughout a game and still come out victorious against another power five opponent. Mm-hmm. I know that Will Shepard knows that he made a mistake. That's that's the part that's tough on this. It, it well, was doesn't just, help him that Tyson Russell got bullied into him. That does not help whatsoever. That uh, just that was when I became unhinged. Just Tyson Russell just getting absolutely obliterated in punt coverage going into going into your returner. Yeah, it does uh, Will probably should have known, but also he's trying to track the ball. Um, Tyson Russell just getting absolutely sunned into Will Shepard, uh, causing a fumble. A part of that that's not being discussed is Vanderbilt also hit the punter during that play. They yep. rushed the punt and hit the punter. So regardless, Wake Forest would have had a first down. That's obviously not a fumbled, a muffed punt return for a touchdown. That's different. But there was another error on top of the fumble made by special teams, inexplicably rushing the punt with 50 seconds. I get it. Kind of, but I'm not a fan of that because I think more often than not, even with the block last week against Alabama A&M by Brian Longwell, more often than not, rushing the punt results in a penalty than it results in actually blocking the punt. And then you set yourself up in a position where you don't have as many blockers set up on the punt return. So it sets you up for an opportunity for these special teams to create a turnover like we saw happen Mm -hmm. because Tyson Russell gets bullied and you don't have additional blockers setting up that return. So terrible play by the special teams there. Then Vanderbilt gets the ball back, throws AJ Swan, throws his second interception of the game and wake misses a field goal. The doors trail wake forest for 24 to 14 going into halftime. The vibes at halftime were not great, Trevor. Uh, They were atrocious. Um, I, at halftime, it was. I mean, there were there were some sparks of hope during um, during the second half, but I, I feel like every Vanderbilt fan that was watching that game knew at halftime they're like, "This is 
Uh, this is just not good. And then even going into the third, in, into the third quarter in the second half, this might be one of the worst middle eight teams in the nation. And it's just, it's been, in, in, I love Clark Lee. I'm a Clark Lee truther. I feel like I have led the hype train on Clark Lee. The Clark Lee in the middle eight is awful. The Stanford game, his first season, middle eight costs in that game. This game, having inexcusable errors right before half and then coming out at halftime and just looking awful defensively. The crucial, crucial time in the game, momentum changing time in the game, and you make dumb mistakes over and over and over again. And I just want it to change, man. I just, this, like you said, this roster is much more talented than it has been in the past. It is still not talented enough to keep making dumb mistakes and turnovers, procedural penalties, Mm -hmm. unnecessary roughness. They are just not there yet. For Vanderbilt to win games, they're going to have to play clean. We do not have the talent to overcome these sorts of mistakes, and it costs them in this game. Coming out in the second half, Wake Forest drives down, hits the ugliest 44-yard field goal I've ever seen in my life. I've ever seen in my life sneak through the uprights, but Wake Forest leads 27-14. to And this is when the game was really over. Vanderbilt drives down the field. Great run by Patrick Smith down to the one, the Wake Forest one-yard line. First and goal on the Wake Forest three-yard line. Run. Stuffed. You're at the Wake Forest one-yard line. Two yards on that run. Then, no gain. Run again on third down. No gain. Run again on fourth down. No gain. Wake Forest stops Vanderbilt at the one-yard line. And then Wake Forest proceeds to drive all the way down the field, 99 yards down the field, and an incredible play by C.J. Taylor. But getting stuffed at the goal line, another missed opportunity for Vanderbilt to pull that game within one possession. That's when I really completely lost faith that this team was going to be able to do it and pull together. Yeah. And you know what? The frustrating thing is I I know it's, it's a joke on Twitter that the quarterback sneak is undefeated quarterback sneaks in the NFL. This is a real statistic. Quarterback sneaks in the NFL work 92% of the time for one yard. For one yard, 92% of the time. I get A.J. has concussion problems. I get that. I get that you might not want to sneak him. I understand that. You have a 6'7 behemoth on your bench in Walter Taylor. Put him under center and just let him get a yard. Just, I don't get it. You have a weapon you have a physical specimen why your why bench. else is walter taylor even in uniform dude like and just to like i i get that in modern football going under center is just not the move anymore i i understand it i get it you cannot tell me you cannot tell me you cannot convince me that there is not multiple plays in Vanderbilt's offensive package that calls for AJ Swan to go under center. You you just you cannot convince me that it is not there. We literally saw AJ sneak for a touchdown against Alabama AM. He snuck it for a touchdown. If you are not comfortable with him sneaking because of health concerns, that's fine. Put Walter Taylor in. He's six seven. He's like two hundred and thirty pounds. Lined up in the shotgun multiple times. It just, it just unexcusable. If Vanderbilt, had, if Vanderbilt unexcusable. had gotten stuffed on three straight quarterback sneaks, then so be it. Then so be it. So I be would it. have been okay. But don't try to get cute. Don't try. Don't try to line up in shotgun at the one yard line. And it's not just a Vanderbilt problem. This is an issue with coaching across the country, even the NFL. I watched it yesterday in the Titan Saints game. The Saints literally have Taysom Hill, and they still decided to turn around and hand the ball off on fourth down against the Titans. Unexplainable. It's coaches trying to be smart when the simple decision is the correct decision. Yep. And that was the turning point in the game. C.J. Taylor gave a dash of hope after uh, knocking the ball loose at the two-yard line against Wake Forest. Let's also not forget, we have a freaking running back on the roster, who's or a fullback. We have a guy who his designated position is fullback. Yeah, he's a walk-on. Dude, put a body out there and put a hat on a hat and get your ass in the end zone. I don't I don't get it. I don't get it. Yeah, that's that's on the entire offense. That's on play calling. That's on the offensive line. That's on the running. It's everybody. 
I mean, there's a lot of question marks and not a lot of answers right now from this team. Vanderbilt gets that stop, but eventually turns the ball over on downs. Wake Forest goes down and goes up 33 to 14 at the beginning of the fourth quarter. And the game was pretty much over from there. I'm going to be honest. I turned the TV off after the one play that we need to get into, which was the turnover on downs, the Will Shepard non-catch and taken back targeting call. Oh my God. Explain to me how that is not targeting. Direct helmet to helmet contact, causing the wide receiver's helmet to fly off of his head, causing him to drop the foot to a defenseless player. To a defenseless player. There's been less targeting calls across college football, and they'll tout that statistic as it being an improvement in player safety, but I just think they've lessened how much they're calling targeting more than anything else. Yes, have players adjusted how they're making hits? Absolutely. But also, they're calling it less strictly. It used to be comical what was called targeting. If you even touched a finger on a player's helmet, it was targeting at the beginning. Now you have forearm, direct helmet-to-helmet contact causing a player's helmet to fly off, and it's overturned on replay. Indisputable video evidence was shown to, to overturn that targeting call. Yeah. I don't understand that at all. And that was officially the end of the game. I turned it off. I couldn't watch anymore. I was sitting there in pure disgust at the amount of missed opportunities that this Vanderbilt team had. Wake Forest then goes down seven plays, 50 yards, three minutes, 15 seconds, goes up 33 to 14. Vanderbilt then drives down. London Humphreys catches a touchdown pass from A.J. Swan, 33-20 to 20 Vanderbilt. They fail in the two-point conversion. Wake Forest drives down, gets another field goal, 36-20. to 20. And that's ball game, folks. Final score, the doors fall to the Wake Forest Demon Deacons, 36-20. to 20. Vanderbilt moves to 2-1 and one on the season. I really don't know where you go from here. This changes the trajectory of the season. The season is not over. Okay, there are still a lot of winnable games on this schedule. The SEC is clearly down this year across the board. Bama got dominated by Texas and the teams within the middle of the pack in the conference are just not at the level they have been at in the past. There are opportunities for wins on this Vanderbilt schedule, but the margin for error is gone. There almost is no more error on the schedule if you want to achieve the publicly stated goal from Clark Lee of making a bowl game. And I think fans had across the board of six and six was the base goal for this team as Vanderbilt fans. You have to beat UNLV next week and you have to go three and one against Kentucky, Florida, Missouri and Auburn. Because I'm not willing to put South Carolina in that same category anymore after the performance they had and Spencer Rattler looking absolutely unstoppable. Well, and two, we've said this on pod. uh, I think that South Carolina could trot out a bunch of Uber drivers and Vanderbilt could trot out the greatest football team ever, ever assembled. And they would lose just because it's South Carolina. So oh. I, you, I don't, I don't care if South Carolina's projected to go. zero and 12, we're not beating them until I see a final score, which is, it's just, they got some juju on us. Yeah. On top of that also being an absolute nightmare matchup. Also being at South Carolina and being at South Carolina, all of those things adding up. I'm taking that South Carolina game out of that category. That's a, that's a guaranteed loss yeah, of winnable SEC games. We'll see when we get to that preview. But Trevor, I think it's about time to get to our three key takeaways from the game. I tell you what, I need a cocktail break, but, though. But before oh, we get to that, you stole the words right out of my mouth. I Trevor. need a drink. It's time for the TDR cocktail break. Grab yourself a cold one and we will be right back Welcome back. I hope you have a beverage sitting next to you. Trevor decided he didn't need an additional beverage. I decided I did. I hope you have an alcoholic beverage. I'm just drinking water. These three keys to the game are not going to be positive. They're going to be our real three key takeaways. There's going to be no spin here. The first thing I want to get into, this isn't a key to the game. It's a criticism I I forgot to leave or I forgot to give during the game recap. Clark Lee's sideline demeanor. 
I am all for a stoic sideline presence. I think I tweeted that out. I'm all for a stoic sideline presence, but you need to know when to go ballistic on the referees and get their attention and get in their ear. And I have not seen that yet from Clark Lee. His in-game management of working referees is not up to par. It is not up to the par of a power five level head coach. It's what you can either be a constant whiner in the ear of the referee and you just know that that's what you're going to have at every single call that is made. The referee is going to have you in their ear. Brian Kelly is a good example. Billy Napier. Clark Lee is the other side. He, he chooses or theoretically chooses when he's going to get into a referee's ear so that his words have more weight. Well, Clark, at some point, you've got to get in their ear because there were a lot of calls throughout that game, including a very weird spot in the middle of the game that gave Wake Forest a key first down that was just inexplicably the chains were moved forward, even though the ball was clearly a yard short of the first down marker and Clark Lee just stood on the sideline, Mm -hmm. never went crazy, never said anything. So is there something that needs to be adjusted? Because I know behind closed doors, Clark Lee's a little more volatile than we see in press conferences. I know he's got a little edge to him. It's time to show some of that on the sideline. It's time to get some calls in Vanderbilt's favor. This is not Notre Dame. You played here, Clark. You have to know this. You have to get in referees' ears for Vanderbilt to be treated like a normal Power Five or even SEC program. You just have to. You Mm -hmm. have to demand respect. You're not going to be given any at Vanderbilt. I know he knows that, but it's time to unleash the dog. It's time to take the dog off the leash, Clark. You have to. And whenever your players see you get into a referee, that is going to revitalize the sideline, a sideline which is dead um, because they know the game is not going their way. I get he wants to be strategic with it, but it's not strategic whenever you just don't do it. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm right there with you, man. It's just this. That's a this is so frustrating. The game plan was not great. Uh, the offensive play calling was not great. And the sideline demeanor from Clark Lee was not great either. I mean, just overall disappointing performance from the players, disappointing performance from the coaches. Trevor, what's your key takeaway? Number one. Uh, my key takeaway is, like I said earlier, the defensive front is super soft. Um, they've probably been the most disappointing um, part of the team for me so far. Um, on this pod, uh, we do not claim to be experts. We do watch a lot of football. We do watch a lot of basketball and baseball. Um, so we do know what we're talking about to an extent, but we are not infallible. Um, and I am willing to admit when I am wrong. And so far, I was, I'm was i very wrong on the defensive front. Um, going up into the season... Um, doing uh, position groups, so on and so forth. And whenever we talked about this team, uh, I thought that the defensive line was going to be standout. I thought they were going to be excellent. I thought Vanderbilt finally had a good amount of depth uh, on the defensive front to where they could maybe get, get some quarterback pressure. Um, and they just don't have it, man. And it's just it's frustrating to see the defensive front in this game. Um even if Wake Forest decided to come out and just air it out like we thought they were going to, they were going to need to be the difference makers. They were going to need to cause pressure. They were going to need to collapse the pocket. They were going to need to make Mitch Griffiths make quick decisions and not let him string that out, and they just didn't, man. And even though they didn't really air it out in this game, you needed them to eat up men. You needed them to make tackles uh, in the run game. You needed them to not open up holes with this offensive line, and they just didn't. Um, it seemed like every it seemed like every play they just got stood up and there was no pressure. They could not move the man in front of them. Uh, it just looked like they were standing there. And so the defensive front as a whole, um, super disappointing, man. I get that Darren Agu is 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 his first game back from an elbow injury, um, but just particularly what I'm seeing from the interior defensive line with with Clifton, Issa, Devin Lee, um, has just been in, just incredibly incredibly disappointing. Yeah, and you said the most disappointing group. I don't think that means the worst group on this team. It just means from where our expectations were. I agree. I won't get too much into that because it's going to be brought up in my keys. But my number one key takeaway from this game is it's just what we have seen all season. This team has been sloppy all year. Game one against Hawaii, they were sloppy. Game two against Alabama A&M, they were sloppy. Game three against Wake Forest, they looked sloppy. We did not expect that from a team that has a lot of returning talent. Is my. It's been one of those days. It's been brother. one of those days. I guess I'll be holding the mic the rest of this time. One you second. That? One now. We'll just keep going. We'll just keep rolling. Is that is that uh is my mic stand just falls off the table? But the entire season, man, 
I think we attributed a lot of it. Maybe it's gold colored glasses, as we always like to say, gold colored lenses. We attributed a lot of the sloppiness and inefficiency to this team was kind of saving, saving uh, the full playbook for when they hit real competition in week three game or game three, week two against Wake Forest. And there was no difference. This game, this team looked the exact same. The offense looked the same. There were the same amount of sloppy missed tackles. There were the same amount of procedural penalties. There was no explosive playmaking or plays or formations that they seemed to be saving for this game. Sloppy, 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 sloppy and missed opportunities. We just expected this team to come in more focused against Wake Forest. Maybe we will see it next week against UNLV, but I've lost faith that this is a well-coached football team at this point. Yeah, I mean, they haven't showed you anything to prove that they are a well-coached football team. They've actually done nothing but shown the opposite, that they are yep. a very sloppy um, football team, and it's been incredibly frustrating. Uh, my key number two is going to be offensive – or my not key number two. My takeaway number two is going to be offensive play calling. Absolutely atrocious as it has been the first couple weeks of the season. Why Vanderbilt – decides to run an RPO offense with AJ Swan makes absolutely no sense to me. You are running outside of the deep balls that we are throwing, which I do appreciate. Um, the base scheme that Vanderbilt is choosing to run is what we ran with Mike Wright. Um, and AJ is not Mike Wright. I do. Whenever you have a pocket passing quarterback, a gunslinger like that, why you don't just opt for the more traditional West Coast pro style offense, an offense that AJ would be much more suited for. I don't get it, man. I don't get it. The play calling makes no sense to me. Um, and the offensive line just, just for some strange reason, just does not seem to be running very well. Whenever these RPOs are getting called, they 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 keep they continue to miss assignments. And they continue to miss men in front of them, and they just don't they don't know where they're going. It looks like it's just. I mean, it's just it's it's so frustrating. I appreciate the deep ball. I do appreciate airing it out. I I, I really do get that, but particularly the play calling. Um, and I won't get into my key number three because it's sort of along the same lines with um with substitutions, players we see in the game, so on and so forth. But offensive play calling, man, it's just been. And I think overall, I think the defensive play calling has been awful too. Like. I get it. Yeah, it was probably good to play three safeties against Wake Forest, anticipating that they're going to air it out. But dude, after the second half, or whenever you've seen what you've seen in the first half, you got to call something different, Nick. De Nick Howell, you you got to do something. The lack different. of adjustments. You just you you. That is what halftime is for. Is for adjustments, and you are making no adjustments. You're just going out there and you're doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting something to be different, expecting something to click. And brother, it is not clicking. I don't get it. Clark Lee says that you're aggressive and you love to send blitzes. Where are they? Let didn't me see, see them. Didn't see him. Didn't see him. He said at SEC Media Days that you are a hyper-aggressive coordinator. It doesn't seem like that. It seems like Vanderbilt's defensive play calling is okay with sitting on their toes and just letting a ball go over their head. It seems like they're okay with not going up to the line of scrimmage and jamming a man and disrupting routes. It just doesn't seem like it. It doesn't seem like the linebackers uh, blitz at all. There's no, there's no intricate stunts. It's just send three, send four, and just look up to God and just hope somebody gets home or hope a bad decision is going to be made. I like what you're doing with CJ Taylor. I get that. I do appreciate putting him all over the field. You have to do that with your playmaker. I get that, but you have to do something other than just sending C.J. Taylor wherever, sending him in the nickel, sending him at linebacker, dropping him back into safety. You have to do something else with the front. You have to do something else with the linebackers. You have to give this secondary help in some situation. Going out there and, 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 and being content with whenever we need to uh, play coverage, throwing Ethan Barr out there. Jesus, Nick, how... What else does he have to show you, dude? I don't get it, man. It just it's so frustrating. Yeah, that's that's hitting on kind of similar to my number three, but my number two is a key takeaway that I think we've all recognized. This defense has regressed somehow. And slash the secondary is beyond hope. That's my key number two, kind of combined two things there. The defense is worse. I don't think we anticipated that at all. 
And also, it's time to scrap whatever you're doing in the secondary. It, it's time to bench the starters. It is truly, it's it it's truly to the point of it can't be worse. It, it's that I don't say that lightly, but legitimately, there would be almost no difference having me out there at cornerback and having B.J. Anderson. It would still be penalties. They would still score on me effortlessly. I'm not saying I would be better. I'm saying it would be almost no difference. And Trevor, we had the pro football focus grades sent to us for this Vanderbilt roster and for players that played more than two snaps during this game. It wasn't just your eyes. B.J. Anderson was the lowest graded player on the entire Vanderbilt defense, just repeatedly being stuck out there when you have Martell Height and Trudell Berry just sitting back there waiting for an opportunity and you just keep sending a guy that clearly doesn't have it out on the field to fail over and over and over again. We don't like calling out individual guys. We never do. But when it's this obvious in your face, it's just accurate criticism. Yep. B.J. Anderson cannot be on the field if this team is going to be successful. Tyson Russell cannot be on the field if this team is going to be successful because you have to provide so much safety help. Just stick the young guys out there, let them sink or swim, and at least develop some experience for the secondary and maybe in a year or two it can improve because right now it just can't be worse it's mm. it's pitiful yeah and shout out to damani for the uh for the pro football focus stuff we we really shout out appreciate Damani. that but yeah i mean dude you're they were playing three safeties part of the game because the secondary needed so much help dude and it's just i mean i don't know we're not here to provide answers no we, 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 that's not our job our job is to bring up valid criticisms and then the men that are paid millions of dollars and hundreds of thousands of dollars to scheme and game plan and coach should be working on figuring it out. But right now, those guys cannot be on the field. You've had three weeks of data. It's been there. Three weeks of data. They've sucked all three weeks. It's time to make a change. And, and Dan Jackson, dude, what are you doing, dude? Oh, I, it's how I, I don't I don't under I don't understand it, dude. Like, how can this keep happening? I don't just repeatedly in the red zone, just having one on one situations on the outside. Dude, how does that happen? Tell they need to media needs to sit him down and somebody needs to ask him dude explain it to us because we don't we don't just walk it, it. walk just us please through it. just just talk to us just explain tell us, it tell us as dumb fans what you have watched on in-game film through three weeks that still has martell height and trudel berry as the no doubt backup cornerbacks yeah just just explain to us what you've seen don't put anything about seniority about leadership i want on-field, in-game performance, this group of cornerbacks has been the Achilles heel of this defense. You've had to scheme around them. It's mm -hmm. time to make a change. It's too late. You've waited too long already. Yep. You've lost a game you shouldn't have lost mm -hmm. because the secondary can't cover. You had to change the whole game plan. And when Clark Lee comes on and says our plan was to allow them to run the ball a little bit, what he's saying is our secondary can't cover for shit. So we have to give up something somewhere. And that's basically what that quote means to me is we don't have the talent in the secondary to send blitzes. So we have to give them help and we just have to deal with the fact that teams are going to run on us. That's not good. No. Make a change. I know Martell Hyde is undersized, but he can at least run with guys mm -hmm. and not commit immediate pass interference penalties or get the ball caught on his head every single time. It's just, dude, and like, I don't like, we don't like dogging on these guys. Like, we want nothing more to, than to see this staff and these players succeed. But, dude, it's just so in your face that you have to say something. You know what I mean? You, everybody, everybody is saying it on Twitter, like, we see what's happening. And just to keep trotting out the same guys and the same game plan over and over and over again. Is almost disrespectful to the fans who you have coaxed along, and we've listen. I've I've drank the juice. I've drunk the juice. I believed, and there's a part of me, a large part of me that still does believe in this team. All off season propaganda was fed to us. This is going to be different, and we believed it. And like I said, part of me still does. To keep doing the same thing over and over and over again is a slap in the face to fans who have been through so much bad football. 
and this year thought that something would be different. Thought that this year something might actually change, but it hasn't. I get it's only week two, game three. I get it. But nothing so far has changed. The Nick Howell, like you said, the defense in, in our in our preview of the defense, you said they they were really bad. There's no way they get worse. They have somehow gotten worse. Yep. It is it's honestly amazing that they have gotten worse. It it truly is an amazing feat. They have somehow regressed given the talent and the return uh, of starters that you have on this defense and the talent that you have gotten recruiting uh, talent that you just ref and that'll get into my part three, just refuse to play. It's not just in the secondary. It's on the defensive front and the linebackers too. just guys. You refuse to play because you have some weird loyalty kink to, to seniority. I don't get it, dude. Is that your key number three? I'll get more into my key number three. Is what the hell are we doing, dude? Play the young guys, like on defense. You're doing, you're doing a great job. Hey, shout out to Joey Lynch. Your game planning and your offensive play calling right now really sucks. But hey, shout out to playing the young guys. I would like to see Cedric Alexander with more than ten carries. Um, that would, I don't know, that maybe makes a lot of sense, a little bit of sense. I think total twenty carries in the entire game. Maybe run the ball a little bit more than twenty times. I don't know. Just give it a whirl, brother. But dude. The refusal to play your guys that you have recruited and that you have brought into the system makes no sense to me. The refusal to play Trudell Berry, the refusal to play Bryce Cowan, the interior defensive line is getting, it's literally getting demolished. And I get that he, we don't have a large sample size of him, but the plays that Demarion Thomas has been in in that interior line, he looks like a prime Fletcher Cox. He got a he got a huge play against Alabama AM. And on that goal line stand, he crumpled, crumpled the offensive line. You, you have Bradley Mann, who, whenever he has been playing, looks like he is playing with a man like a playing like a man possessed. His hair is on fire. He has been a game wrecker in the interior line. And you refuse to play him. Shout out to playing Savion Riley. I love it. I think Savion has been doing awesome. I'm glad that Martell is getting more playing time. Martell has been good. Yeah, mistakes are going to come with the, as a freshman. I get that. We're okay with that. Play Trudell, dude. I don't get it. Like, I don't understand this coaching staff's loyalty to Derek Mason, guys. I get it. Loyalty is good. Loyalty to bad players is going to cost you games. It costs you the Wake Forest game. Loyalty over talent, I get it. In theory, you're like, oh, yeah, I want to want to pay respect to the guys that have been here. That is going to lose you games when you don't play talent, and it lost you this Wake Forest game by refusing to play talent and refusing to treat or to go with loyal or uh, talent over loyalty, and it's going to lose you games the rest of the season if you don't change it quick. Yes, I, I agree with a lot of what you said. My key number three, we've hit on it a lot, but the play the play calling has to be more creative. And the majority of what that means to me, and this is going to sound really backwards, but you've got to quit spreading the ball around. This the the first three plays of this game are exactly what I'm talking about. I understand that they are fo that the Wake Forest defense is going to be focused on Will Shepard. It's going to be focused on Jaden McGowan. I get it. You have to find creative ways to get the ball and get, have one-on-one -on -one situations for your best playmakers on the outside. Mm -hmm. So this is the best example I can give. Second play of the game, you run a quick out, a quick just a quick dump off to Justin Ball. That was the first read on that play. And he got eaten up by a turf monster. If he could have turned that up the field, it probably would have, would have been a first down or close to one or more. But the point I'm making is that play was schemed to get the ball in Justin Ball's hands in a one-on-one -on -one situation. He's clearly like number six or seven on this offense in after-the-catch playmaking ability. So him slipping on the turf monster, you can write that off if you're a coach or as a fan casually saying, oh, if he wouldn't have slipped. But you schemed the play for a guy that doesn't have the ability to make guys miss or turn the ball up the field after the catch. That's not dismissing Justin Ball. I get he's going to have that one-on-one -on -one situation easier because he's not a primary focus of the defense, but that's why he's not a primary focus of the defense. 
because they're like, ah, he's not going to be able to make it turn it into a big play. He's just not. And proven he can't. You have an individual small amount of plays in a college football game. You have to maximize the number of opportunities for your playmakers to get into the open field and turn small plays into big plays. That's the entire goal of an offensive coordinator. And right now, you're doing things like hitting quick out routes to Justin Ball and throwing up deep fade patterns on third down on the first drive of the game to your backup tight end and Logan Kyle. That's the first read on those plays. That's the primary target on those plays. It doesn't make any sense. It's it's not lazy. That's the wrong word. It's overthinking it. You are doing things that are not utilizing your talent in the best way possible. And right now, I think it's it's the definition. Coaches would shake their head and say, oh, it's what happens. They're, they're too close to the situation. They, they've watched too many reps of these guys in practice. They've seen too many plays. You see it all the time in coaching. Take a step back. Give Will Shepard 15 targets a game. Give Jade McGowan 10 targets a game. Give Quincy five targets a game. Everybody else can take a few. That's how you win. Mm -hmm. Give your carries to your playmakers. I think Cedric Alexander deserves more opportunities, but Patrick Smith did have a pretty decent game, even though he didn't unhitch the trailer. Yeah. There's got to be something different than the exact same offense that we saw last season. Mm -hmm. I see no changes utilizing the playmakers in more dynamic ways. I see no changes in this offense utilizing the gunslinger mentality and arm talent of A.J. Swan. I see the same offense that Joey Lynch designed and used last year with Mike Wright as the starting quarterback. And right now, that is the main frustration of fans is he stuck to his guns, run the same shitty offense we saw for the last two seasons, and now we're here watching the same shitty numbers be put up with more flashy stats because you have a talented quarterback, but you're not utilizing him in the way that's that's best. I don't have the answers. I'm not an offensive coordinator. Maybe that's maybe that's not the most intelligent thing to say is to point out criticisms and not provide answers, but something has to change. I think that's what fans are so frustrated about. This season is 25% over. 25% of this season is gone, and we are seeing the same game plan that we saw against Hawaii, against Wake Forest in game three that we saw in game one. Same game plan that didn't work game one, it didn't work efficiently in game two, and it didn't work in game three. Let's see something different. Mm -hmm. What the hell is going on through the entire week of practice? It's the same play calls. It's the same fade routes. It's the same red zone opportunities and plays missed repeatedly. You just had a more talented Wake Forest defense than you've seen in the first couple of weeks that capitalized on the lazy play calling and obvious predictable play calling. So, Joey Lynch, it's time to step your shit up. The talent is there. The offensive line has its issues. Coach plays a lot of missed assignments. There's things to work on. But you can't blame receiver talent, and you can't blame quarterback arm talent right now. The scheme is bad. The primary reads are not open. It's time to change something. I want to see something different, not just the same first play of the game is going to be a runoff tackle to Patrick Smith for two to three yards. Second play of the game is going to be a short dump off pass to a non playmaker. Third play of the game is going to be some deep route, uh, like 30 yards down the field on third and five, third and six. That's how it feels like games have opened up in the Joey Lynch era. I don't have the data in front of me to back that up, but it's how I'm feeling. And I'm sure a lot of people out there are frustrated without the correct words to express it because it feels lazy yep. right now. It feels like we were fed a lot of bullshit through the off through the off season. It does. Yeah. Things haven't changed. Things are the same. Clark Lee doesn't feel in control. He just doesn't. The sideline doesn't feel in control. It doesn't feel like this team is making less mistakes than they made last year. It feels like they're making more mistakes than they made last season. We kind of gave in to these teams have improved throughout the season under Clark Lee in year one. They got they were better at the end of the year than they were at the beginning. In year two, this team was obviously much better at the end of the season with wins against Kentucky and Florida before the bad 56 to nothing Tennessee loss. They clearly improved throughout the season. In year three, you kind of expect to just come out guns blazing with so much returning talent, and that's been the most disappointing part. Mm -hmm. This doesn't look like a team with the in the third year of a head coach and staff with a lot of returning players this doesn't feel like that this feels like year one 
of a new staff and new players and new head coach. I know you have a new quarterback starting in AJ Swan, but he's been in the program last season. He started four games or three games last season and played a significant role in others. There's something wrong. Mm -hmm. I'm not in the locker room. Trevor's not in the locker room, but everyone can feel it. Something is wrong. Fix it. That's not great advice, but something's wrong within that locker room. I know you can feel it too, Trevor. It's just, just, Nick Howell, Joey Lynch, just get a grip, man. Just, I, I, I don't know how many more weeks of sloppy football we can see before something changes. I don't know if it's personnel. I, I, I know on defense, it sure as hell personnel, but just the offensive play calling, dude, you got to change it up. If your run game is not working between the tackles, hey, Joey, Maybe utilize running backs in the passing game, which is an extension of the run game, basically. That seems like a novel idea. Maybe it's not Ray Davis out of the backfield this no. year. No. You you have Patrick Smith, who that was kind of his thing a little bit. Maybe I'm wrong. I thought he was a pretty solid pass catcher out of the backfield. Yep. And you have somebody who's very explosive in Cedric Alexander. Just do something. Wide man. receiver screens. Screens, dude. Something. You're not. Those, James routes. Franklin made a living off of wide receiver screens. Derek Mason just abandoned that, and now Clark Lee and Joey Lynch have also abandoned that. You see it across the country in offenses like Tennessee. Get your playmakers with the ball in one-on-one -on -one situations and see what happens. Yep. They don't have to be schemed wide open. Just get Jaden McGowan in a one-on-one -on -one situation. And just let him work. And if he gets tackled, and if he has 10 catches and gets tackled every time, then I think fans would be okay with that. But seeing repeatedly playmaking opportunities given to other players that are not your studs is frustrating. Mm -hmm. It just is. London Humphreys has been outstanding. He, he's looked very good as a freshman. He has. Yeah. Will Shepard... Quincy Skinner Jr. and Jade McGowan would have made the exact same catches that London Humphreys has made. It's like you're trying to scheme in and provide a wider variety of players catching the football on purpose. It, it's very weird to me. I'm not dismissing anything Humphreys has done at all, but it's the opposite of what you're talking about on defense. Yeah. It's, it's like you just keep repeatedly playing the same guys on defense that are having no success, but you but you're not repeatedly going to the same guys that are having repeated success on the offensive side of the football. It's like, oh, Will Shepard has caught a ton of one-on-one -on -one touchdowns in the red zone. No reason to throw him the ball too much outside of the red zone. Yeah. You know, you can't give him too many targets when you're not inside the 20. Whenever you have playmakers, force feed your playmakers. I... It is it's that simple. I wouldn't be simple. I wouldn't be as mad at the third and five play call. I'd still wouldn't like it because I don't like a fade on any third down situation, third and ten or less. But I would not be near as angry if that ball was thrown to Will Shepard in double coverage. Yep. I just wouldn't. But there's no chance in hell Logan Kyle is coming down with a fade. There just isn't. He's not that guy. That's why he changed positions from wide receiver to tight end. Joey, you're too close to the situation. Take a step back and get the dogs playmaking opportunities and let the dogs eat. Well, and it's just frustrating. Like, like Nick Howell and Joey Lynch have just seen the same offense and the same defense over and over and over and refuse, refuse to do anything different. More, uh, my big qualm is on defense more than Nick Howell and Dan Jackson just – refuse to do anything different. Dan Jackson refuses to play Trudell Berry. He opts for the sixth year senior who we've just seen over and over and over again, get toasted. And just, there's something in his brain that thinks this next, this next series is going to be different. I, I don't get it, dude. I don't loyalty to guys is it lost you this game i don't i don't get it is it, it, it's, it's time to it's time to make a change but not at quarterback that's the last thing i want to get to here before we close it out everybody calling for a quarterback change aj swan made some questionable decisions but i want everyone just the raw data to keep in mind sec qbrs in week two 
Spencer Rattler at the top with a 93.5. Jaden Daniels at number two, 89.6. Will Rogers, number three, 84.7. Connor Wagman from Texas A&M, 83.5. And then at number five in the conference, A.J. Swan with a 72.5. And he had a bad game. And that was not a a good game. A.J. Swan made bad decisions. Absolutely, he made bad decisions. The rest of the team played horribly. And that was why Vanderbilt lost this game. The season is not over. There are opportunities on the horizon. UNLV next week will have the preview dropping later this week. But the Kentucky game is another huge opportunity. The kickoff time has been announced, 11 a.m. Central Time. Thank God it's 11 a.m. 11 a.m. kick, Man Mosa time on SEC Network. The lot's open earlier on 11 a.m. The lot's open at 7 a.m. We will be out there early with a smaller tailgate set up for that Kentucky game. But... That's about it from the Wake Forest recap. Any any final words on that one, or did you get most of uh most of your issues vented out? Dude, it's just so frustrating. Like I, I want to be- I want to believe so bad, and we were fed, and, and I gladly ate it up. I consumed the Vanderbilt propaganda this off season. Could it still come to fruition? Yeah, maybe. I I, I believe that it can, but dude, like. It's just so we were told that this season was going to be different. We were told that 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 this season bowl and and I get uh, the bowl opportunity is still there. There are still winnable games in the schedule, but man, your first real opportunity against competition, and you just crap the bed like this. It's it it makes me think that it's just the same nonsense again. And I I it, I hope I'm wrong. It feels like the phrase "same old Vanderbilt." I hate that phrase, but that's what it feels like right now. This has been, for myself, Will Byram, and my co-host, Trevor Hewlin. Is that right? That is indeed correct. Trevor Hewlin. This has been episode 237 of The Door Report, powered by Corey Perkins of Parks Realty.